let's start with essential thrombocythemia or ET. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think the first thing is, is taking an inventory of symptoms, seeing how symptomatic the patient might be. Um, again, there are some patients who are asymptomatic or have few symptoms and they were uh, told of a high platelet count during a routine visit. So some patients can be observed if they have few symptoms and especially if they fall into a lower vascular risk category. So symptom assessment first. Second, you know, looking at vascular risk and there's four categories of risk in ET in terms of predicting the likelihood of a future blood clotting event. There's a very low, low, intermediate, and high risk group, and that's based on a patient's age, whether they've had a blood clot before, and the type of mutation they have. JAK2 mutations increase the risk of clotting. So if a patient falls into a higher risk group, say they're older than 60 with a JAK2 mutation, or they've had a prior blood clot, those are patients who are generally treated more aggressively with cytoreduction. And then the other thing is aspirin. Um, we often see aspirin given to all patients with ET, but not all patients with ET necessarily need it. The role of aspirin is actually a little less clear in ET. Um, for a very low risk patient, there, there's a potential for more harm than benefit, especially if a patient lacks a JAK2 mutation. So the, the evidence base to support aspirin for all ET patients is just not there. It's evolving. What about polycythemia vera or PV? So there's a few standards. All, it's different. The aspirin question in, in PV is generally answered by um, randomized data from 16 years ago. In 2004, it's been shown that aspirin reduces the risk of clotting in PV patients. So generally, we give low-dose aspirin to all patients. And hematocrit control is really important. You know, at least a goal of 45% or less is mandated in PV. And then there are patients who might fall into a higher risk category, older than 60 or have had a prior blood clot. They need something more. And then I'd also emphasize that there are lower risk patients who may not be traditional candidates for cytoreduction, reduction, but they could have symptoms that really interfere with quality of life. And symptoms alone can be the trigger to add something more to the phlebotomy and aspirin program. What about uh, things like interferon? So interferons are have been used in MPNs for decades and decades and decades. So long-standing history with interferons, the issue has been tolerability. There's um, these days uh, a class called pegylated interferon that's longer acting. And I think there's been a lot more use, at least in the last 10 years, still much more in an academic setting than a community practice. But interferons have a pretty established role in MPNs, especially polycythemia vera, for sure in ET, less so in myelofibrosis.